Good evening. My name's uh, Sam Bazzini, a CEO and co-founder of Warpaint. Uh, before I get fully into the presentation, just like to show you a short video to show you what Warpaint is all about. So at uh, Warpaint, we produce affordable, high-quality, on-trend color cosmetics under several of our own brands, our lead brand being W7. We employ 140 people worldwide. Uh, we have 170,000 square foot of warehouse and office space in the UK, as well as offices in the US, China, and Hong Kong. In the US, we use our office as a sales office. And in China and Hong Kong, we use our office for quality control and sourcing our products. We outsource all our manufacturing. Uh, we find this gives us the best quality, it ensures the best price um, and ensures the best service. And we use multiple factories so we can, can move around if we are not happy with the price, the quality or the service we receive. All paint, we're profitable, we're cash generative, we've got a strong balance sheet, we're debt free and we're dividend paying. <clears throat> So 2023 was a record year for Warpaint. Uh, revenues were 89.6 million against 64.1 million in 2022. It's 40% up. Uh, the gross profit margin was also up from 36.4% in 2022 to 39.9% in 2023. And PBT, again, was also up from 7.7 .7 million in 2022 to 18.1 million in 2023. At the end of 2023, we had 9.1 million pounds in cash against 5.9 million pounds in 2022. 
worth mentioning at uh, this point, the, the final dividend of 6p for 2023, bringing the total to 9p for 2023 against 7.1p in 2022. <clears throat> uh, operational highlights for 2023, we're up in, uh, up in all geographies, 18% up in the UK, 61% up in Europe, 37% up uh, in the US and the rest of the world, 57% up. Um, and the sales grew across all brands with 64% up uh, in uh, with our W7 brand and our Technic brand was 21% up. So it was, it was growth right across all geographies and across all brands. We also had uh, further customer expansion uh, in Asda, uh, Etos, uh, who've got 450 stores in Holland, a super drug type store uh, that we opened late last year. Um, Sally Beauty, super drug, we rolled out last year into 71 stores. We've just announced they've given us an, another 60 plus stores that we'll go into in July. Uh, Webra, another Dutch retailer with 250 stores. Uh, and we also had expansion, further expansion into Boots, CVS, HEB, New Look, and uh, Tesco. E-commerce was also up from 2022, 121% uh, with revenues of 6.2 million against the previous year. First quarter of 2024 trading update. Uh, strong trading has continued into 2024. We had a record first quarter of 23.5 million against 18.4 million uh, in 2023, 28% uh, up on the same period. Uh, gross margin, I'm pleased to say we've continued to grow our margin. And the main driver of this is resourcing of our existing product as well as when we make new products, uh, our new product development mix, we start with a blank uh, canvas, if you like, and we engineer the product to make sure we can get the correct margin for the business and even tick it up again. Our expansion strategy continues. We just announced we're going into Walmart with a range of W7 and Chit Chat uh, at the end of uh, this year. And we've also launched our Technique brand into 202 Morrison stores. As well as launching into these new retail partners, we've also expanded into more CVSs, another 379 stores, more boots, more five below, and more super drug stores. And it's not just small stores, we're also getting more space in the stores that we're in. E-commerce has continued to grow. First quarter of 2024, we're 41% up on the same period last year. And the outlook, outlook, given the strong start to the year, we're confident that we can keep growing the business this year and beyond. The house broker has just upgraded his forecast uh, for war paint for 2024. He's forecast revenues of 104 million with, an, with a, a PBT of around 23 million, and we're comfortable with his forecast. <clears throat> strong value proposition. This slides up our this re, this slide really sums up our lead brand W7. We're not trendsetters, we're followers of fashion. And our new product development department follow their prestige brands very, very closely. If anything interesting or innovative comes onto the market, we try and get the W7 version out within three to six months. And uh, the W7 version is both similar in look and quality. The quality of the product is very important. These inspired products or dupes as they're known in the trade represent about 30% of what we do. The rest is core, uh, a red lipstick, <clears throat> a red nail polish, a black mascara, but this 30% is what creates the buzz and interest around the brand. And if you look on this slide, there's just some examples and I'll point, point you to the one top in the middle, Huda Beauty. Uh, produced uh, an eye palette, the prestige version for £62. And on, on the left-hand side is the Socialite eye palette, the W7 version at 9 95 both similar in look and quality. And when we go to see buyers, I use this slide along with samples of the prestige brand and our brand to explain the, the concept of the W7 brand. And, and they all absolutely love the whole concept and the way our products allude to what the prestige product is. 
Uh, and, and once on shelf, the consumer immediately understands the proposition. They understand the look they're going to get, the value they're getting, because they've been seeing and reading about it on social media for three to six months. OK, so I put this slide in really just to show the comparisons and the opportunity I believe we have in uh, the US. So on, on the left, you'll see uh, the UK colour cosmetic market is worth 1.8 billion. And underneath, you've got the US market, which is 18 billion, the, the 10 times the size of the UK in the UK, we did £33 million last year in revenue, which, uh, to put into perspective, we only did sort of £7 million in the US. So to me, 10 times the size, £33 million, there is an opportunity for us to perhaps do £330 million. So there is plenty of room for growth. In the UK, other similarities between the UK and the US, two-thirds of women use colour cosmetics daily or a few times a week. The same applies to the US. In the UK, 79% think the price of a product is an important criteria. In the US, it's 68%. We're an affordable brand. We're in a cost of living crisis. So we're well placed to take advantage of the current economic situation. And in the, in the UK, 67% think affordable brands perform as well as prestige brands. In the US, it's 74%. As I mentioned earlier, we are a dupe brand, we follow the prestige brands, we make a good quality product. So looking at all this data from Mintel, I believe that um, we are, Warpaint are well placed to succeed both in the UK and the US markets. Strategy for growth, which we split up into six pillars. The first pillar is develop and build our core brands. We focus on five brands. The first brand, uh, W7, our lead brand, which is 68% of what we do. I've already explained a young on trend color cosmetic brands targeting sort of 16 to 30 year olds. Actually goes a bit younger than that, a bit older than that, but that is our, our main demographic. Technic, an affordable, everyday, essential color cosmetic brand, uh, a much wider demographic, uh, a much more uh, not so much following uh, sort of the dupe model, just uh, general cosmetics, demographics sort of 25 to 45 year olds. We've got body collection, which is more focused on skincare and premium packaging. It's for an older demographic. Man stuff and men's toiletry range, shower gel, shaving foams. And finally, Chit Chat, a pre-teen color cosmetic brand where the fun begins. And all these brands do something different. They don't cannibalize each other. If you look at if you look at this slide, you can see they're all very different. They could all be in one store. You'd think they were different manufacturers. So we don't allow the amount of SKUs to prol proliferate out of control. And because we focus on these five brands, we're growing brand equity in each and every one of them. And this is helping to grow our margin and profitability across the business. <clears throat> Develop and nurture current business. <clears throat> this is all about growing and protecting our existing customer base. There's no point in inquiring new retailers like Boots, Tesco, Superdrug and CVS if you don't look after what you've got. So we're, we're very focused on looking after the current customer base. And the first quarter up 28%. And I'm pleased to say the lion's share is from our existing customer base. There's been no major pipe fills in this growth. Grow market share in the UK. This is what I like to call our 75% strategy. Our business grew up in the discount sector with the likes of B&M, TK Maxx, Savers. This only represents 25% of the colour cosmetic market. So it gives us uh, another 75% to go after. The larger retailers, the Tesco's, the Boots, Super Drugs, now Morrison's. The first large retailer we landed was Tesco in 2020. We started off in approximately 50 stores. We're now in over 1,400 stores in various different guises, and there is still room to grow. We certainly haven't maxed out in there in terms of 
<clears throat> products and, and uh, space. And we used all the learnings and the success from Tesco to open doors into other large retailers, uh, some of which are listed on this slide. Grow the US and China market share. In the US, uh, we have a much tighter range. We have around 200 best-selling hero lines. We use third-party logistics. So we don't want to have a slow moving stock. We only want our best sellers there. Um, and in the US, like the UK, we target the large retailers. In the last couple of years, we've opened five below, CVS, HEB in Texas. And later this year, uh, we're launching our W7 and Technic brands into Walmart, which is the largest retailer in the world and, and, and a tar has been a target retailer for us for some time. In China, we sell directly to the consumer online. We use platforms such as Tmail and Red, sort of Amazon equivalents in China. We manufacture in China. We have a, a proper business there, uh, boots on the ground, which is not easy to do, and they, they run the business. We manufacture in China. We have a responsible person there. We register our products in China. We ship them from the factory to a fulfillment house. And we have a customer service company that helps us get KOLs, key opinion leaders, and influencers to, influencers to help us promote the brand and grow the brand there. And the business is growing steadily and, and most importantly, profitably. <clears throat> uh, grow online sales. In 2019, we decided to focus and grow our online sales. Up until then, we'd only ever used our marketing tool, uh, our website as a marketing tool. So the first thing is we stopped supplying retailers. And, and the result is in 2019, we had a we had 180,000 pounds of revenues on our online offering. And in 2023, we were 6.2 million pounds. And we were already 41% up in the first quarter this year. So we expect it to, to grow again this year. In the UK, we sell on our own website and we sell on Amazon. And in the US and Europe, we sell on Amazon, solely on Amazon. We've got no infrastructure in Europe and in the US. So we feel Amazon is the best option for us. Uh, Amazon offers something small and light, so we can ship our goods out very, very cheaply. Uh, people often ask us, you know, can you be profitable on Amazon? The answer is we are profitable. We make a similar PBT margin to the rest of the business. They also ask us, could we grow faster? We absolutely could grow faster. <clears throat> but we've looked around at some of our peers and a lot of online businesses, and it's very, very easy to earn to, to burn cash online. So we're very, very focused, you know, on, on growing our online business, but growing it profitably and sustainably. And it gives us again the same sort of PBT margin around 20% as the rest of the war paint business. ESG, environmental social governance. Uh, it's important to our customers, consumers, and our investors. So it's something we take seriously. We're doing uh, several things, a lot of things. You're reducing air travel, a few of the things we're doing. We, can, we are vegan and paraben free on all new products. And on any existing products that we order, we reformulate so that they comply. We're reducing plastic packaging where possible. We've also been working with a company called Planet Mark since 2022. We've received certification from them uh, for our business, and they put in, in place a strategy to help us reduce and monitor our carbon footprint. These are just some of the things we're doing, uh, and there's lots more, and all details can be found on the Warpaint London PLC website. <clears throat> So this is a question. This is a question we get asked all the time. So we've put this slide in. What is the growth opportunity within the stores we are in? So, if you look at the UK, we have twenty key customers. They have a total of thirteen thousand stores in the UK. We're in six thousand one hundred of those stores. Leaves us a, a potential of six thousand nine hundred further stores that we could go into. So, a good example is. We're in 71 super drugs, soon to be a few more. But the potential is they've got approximately 900 stores. So there, there's a, a possibility of going into 829 more stores, approximately. In the US, uh, we've got 12 key customers. 
uh, a total uh, the cost the, the total estate of these customers is 24,200 stores um we're currently in 6,700 of those stores so it leaves a potential of 17 and a half thousand in Europe we have nine key customers currently in 7,200 stores current stores are in 2,300 leaves a potential of 4,900 stores so if you add up this whole store count we've got a possibility of going into another 29,300 stores question we have been asked <clears throat> over the last sort of week and a half how many of these stores realistically do you think you could go into and you'd want to be in would probably the answer is probably about 25,000 stores so there's a, a huge opportunity for growth finally the summary why invest in war paint um Record profits in 2023 with revenues of 89.5 million with a PBT of 18.1 um, and uh, further growth expected this year. Planned launches into major retailers this year as well as further growth within retailers already in. We have a profitable e-commerce business which is growing. Uh, and finally, for me, the most compelling reason to invest in war paint, we're profitable. We've got a strong balance sheet with dividend paying, cash generative, and we've got absolutely no debt, not even, as I like to say, a photocopier on lease. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Good to hear about a company that's really doing well, as, uh, as war paint is. Um, can I just remind delegates, if you want to ask a question, uh, click the Q&A button and you can type it into the, the question box on the screen. Uh, we do have a, a number of questions, uh, several from Damien uh, to begin with, all good questions, I think. Um, so the first question if, is, markets outside Denmark grew much less strongly, which maybe suggests that they are mature, saturated or highly competitive. Have war paint benefited from being a first mover or do you have an enduring advantage, do you believe? Uh, well, the, the, the Denmark business is a little bit of a red herring. These people have 100 shops in France. They have shops in Holland. They have shops in Scandinavia. In fact, they, they've only, I think, got about, I would say sort of 15% of their estate is in Denmark, but the the business was originally from Dem Denmark. That's who we invoice to, but they have hubs and shops all over Europe, probably about 600 shops and they're still growing. So it, it's not just Denmark, it's the whole of Europe. Right. Thanks. I think that clarifies that, that point. Um, Damien also asks about uh, interest income which he observes from the accounts uh, seems to be minimal. So is he right to infer that the cash balance is generally zero or, or isn't earning any interest? The cash ba balance, we, you know, we have peaks and troughs during the year um, and we gear up. Uh, so at the end of the year, we've got a lot of, we usually have a, a lot of cash at the end of the year. Um, mm. But the minute January comes, we've got a lot of orders coming in that we're paying for because we want to get stock in before Chinese New Year. We hold a lot of stock. Mm -hmm. We make no apologies for that. Uh, we can afford to do that. The just-in-time model is broken. So our, our uh, we tend to keep as much of our, our, our cash, if you like, in stock rather than cash sitting around we do get it we put a bit on deposit there are peaks and troughs during the year we also spend a lot of money just after the half year we've always got a lot of cash at the half year but come july we're paying for all the gift we're paying for our corporation tax we're paying the dividends uh we have got uh facilities that we dip into sort of july and august because everything's coming at once but they're sort of cleared out by september so no we don't have a lot of surplus cash during the year. It's all in stock and working to pay, uh, you know, to, to generate profit and sales. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, that makes sense. So next, Colin asks, 
as a fashion follower, how close can you go to the lead brands without infringing copyright? Uh, when was your last lawsuit in this area? Well, if we we get we get asked all the time, do we ever get any letters from uh, the big boys, if you like? Yes, we do. Not as many as you'd think, not many, because we stay well within the law. It's something called uh, passing off, providing you're not deceiving people or confusing people. In answer to when was the last lawsuit, we haven't had one. We've never paid any damages, and we've been doing this for 20 years. So at the moment, no lawsuits, no damages paid, um, and uh, no real issues. Thank you. Um, then Nick asks about your pricing strategy. Um, are you increasing the prices of your products? What is the split of volume as against price in your 2023 results? Uh, and is it expected to be similar for 2024? Okay, so we haven't had a price. I don't understand the second bit of the question. <laughs> okay. mm. I, the, we haven't had a price increase since 2000 and January 2022. We're an affordable mm -hmm. brand. If we can avoid it, we avoid it. We set our budget in October, end of October, beginning of November, and we decide then whether we need a price increase. We start to look at dollars. I mean, there are what I would call price increases by stealth, as I mentioned earlier, any new product development, you know, we try and tick the price up. We used to like to say when we came onto the market, we buy for a pound and we sell for two. Now we buy for a pound and try and sell for 212 as the brand is sort of getting traction and uh, and is starting to get recognition. You can charge a bit more for a brand. So we, we are avoiding the price increases. Just repeat sort of that question to me, uh, the second part of the question. What was the yes, answer? It's a little difficult to understand. So, so he asks, what is the split of volume as against price in your 2023 uh, results? Uh, yeah most most of it is is volume that yes yeah there's no that we we and, and we haven't sacrificed margin to get what you can see we you yes, know we margins we, we increased we increased uh from 64 million in sales in 2000 and, and uh 24 to 22 to 89 million in 2023 and actually the margins up so we didn't sacrifice we didn't go look for volume uh, and sacrifice margin. We actually grew our margin, um, uh, keeping the prices the same, and uh, and, uh, and not and and uh, not reducing our margin. Mm -hmm. So, just on that, that same sort of theme, uh, are you seeing any pressure from your suppliers to increase their prices, or, or are they keeping relatively stable? How about how about their, their input costs? We, we haven't seen that. There's plenty of capacity in China. They haven't had the issues with energy mm -hmm. that we've had. Uh, so actually, prices have remained the same. If we if we had to have a price increase, we would have one. Um, mm -hmm. we, we may decide you know, in January next year, it would be prudent to have a price increase, but it won't be 10% or it would maybe be few percent but we you know at the moment if we don't have to have one we're quite happy you know we're an affordable brand and uh we want to keep it that way yeah and i guess it's helpful that in china uh there's uh, things are actually deflationary rather yeah. than inflationary so that that certainly there's, doesn't do any harm from your perspective there's been there's plenty of capacity in china there's mm. plenty of there's plenty of capacity great thanks Okay, and then Rebe Rebecca, first of all, comments, great results. Sam, congratulations on the recent, recent share sale. Coffee Thank is you, Rebecca. Here at Mello. <laughs> okay, uh, more seriously, uh, re your expansion into Walmart. Can you tell us the key differences in the products they're taking over the products you sell in the UK, please? Uh, there, there aren't really any differences. They are products that we sell in the UK. They've taken... Uh, seven w7 products uh and four chit chat products the uh some of it is gift uh some of it they're trialing sort of four of our w7 products in sort of their beauty section to sort of launch the brand and see how it sells so they're not they're not any different products uh 
to the UK. It's the same sort of. Thanks. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you, you keep relatively high stock levels um, because, as you say, just the just-in-time model is, is broken. Uh, but Colin asks on that subject, uh, your stock turn has been improving in recent years from 1.8 times to 2.3 times, according to his calculations. Mm. My concern centres on the extent you have visibility on sell-through and what will not be left with large stock write-offs given the six plus months of stock on the books. Can you give colour around this process to avoid? Well, that's usually a, a question for the CFO, but I can give you some colour around it. Our, okay. You know, every year um, our auditors, BDO, are all over the stock. It's the biggest mm -hmm. asset mm -hmm. on the balance sheet. And we write off our stock after two years. You know, if we've still mm -hmm. got stock after two years in – at the end of 2022, and this is off the top of my head, we had about £19 million worth of stock, and we had to allow for about £300,000 uh, worth of write-downs, which we'd already written down. This year, we had £28 million worth of stock, and BDO you know, wrote off, I think, about £325,000 worth of stock. You know, We are monitoring our stock all of the time. As we're growing into the big retailers, it's actually easier to forecast because mm -hmm. they're not, oh, we fancy 20,000 of this. If you're in, for example, 100 super drugs, we know that every week they sell 1.1 red lipsticks per store and 1.2 mascaras and 3.3 nail polishes. So you, you are able to forecast. Mm -hmm. We do about 15 million pounds worth of gift every year. Um, that is all pre-sold, probably a bit more than that. Maybe it's 17 million, something like that. You know, that is all forecast and pre-sold. So, you know, uh, uh, the proof of the pudding, I suppose, is in the eating. We're not getting left, you know, a 1.3% stock provision is, is not a lot. We don't get, we're, we're quite acute with uh, monitoring our stock and with what we order. Yes, yeah. well, that's that's very good, uh, as you say. Right off some that. Oh, do you know what? My, 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 sorry, my colleagues here just reminded me that mm -hmm. you know if we do get surplus stock, uh, we come from a world of of clearance. So we've got our CFO likes to call it his washing machine. You know, <laughs> so we 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 can place the stock, and 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 for the most part, we replace we place it at a because if it gets written down by half. We can replace it. We usually get a profit on it. We get a small profit. We're not losing money on stock, clearing it out. So it's, it's worth noting right. that. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Okay. Uh, Simon asks, do you consider <clears throat> remaining debt-free part of the DNA of the company and hence part of the investor proposition? Yes. Yeah. I mean, Ian and I come from a world... Uh, it's it, it, you know I've been trading since I was since 1982 since I was 18 and we've the only debt we've ever had is a is a mortgage on a property where we had a warehouse it was it's better to have a mortgage than than sort of a pay rent and it, it, it is in our DNA not to have debt you know it it, it, it suits us that way yeah I think for, for most individual investors that's certainly a positive great. Uh, then uh, Damien has another question. Um, the US is described as a big market opportunity, but it's still just 8% of total sales, same as in the previous financial year. Mm. Surely it needs to grow more strongly to achieve the implied potential of that market. Well, we are growing it as fast as we can. It grew, I suppose, in line with the rest of the business. Uh, I think what people have to appreciate, we're trying to grow organically and profitably we're not going to go along to a big retailer and say look here's here's two million dollars give us a thousand doors what we'll do is we did exactly what we've done with cvs we went into 190 stores uh at the beginning of 2023 uh they've just given us another 379 stores we hope to get more next year we'll grow the business and we'll do it um steadily and sustainably uh yeah i agree we need to to grow it faster we will i mean the other side of the coin is there's plenty of room for growth so uh you know it's uh it's something we will grow but we won't burn cash to grow it mm -hmm. 
So, so if I've understood correctly, you do expect the growth in the US to, to accelerate as, as the brand presumably gets better known. And, uh, I, I would expect it to do that. I mean, you know, as I say, we've, we've just got into Walmart. It's been a target retailer of ours. It does take time. And we've done that without splashing the cash, if you like. You know, we, we're using the learnings and the success on, of, of the other retailers that we're in to mm -hmm. sort of uh, state the case to, to get into these these retailers. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, and then someone with a question about the secondary placing. Can you confirm that all the shares from the secondary placing were bought by institutional investors? Uh, they were. <laughs> nice, simple answer, right. thank you. <laughs> Great, okay. And then uh, from Thanos, uh, thanks for the update. Few questions. Uh, great to see the cash remaining strong with no debt. Uh, could you provide some clarity on whether cash spent on inventory is for pre-contracted sales? Uh, well, we've already talked about the stocks. The second part, I think you've already answered. But but yeah, is uh, is much of the stock on on for pre-contracted sales? Not at the moment. It will be as we get into July and pay for the gift. The stock, the, the stock we've purchased at the moment, for the most part, there might be a few that are for, for orders, uh, is a bit going to Australia. But for the most part, uh, it's just where, you know, uh, we forecast. We've got a team that forecasts what we need and uh, they buy in the stock as we need it. Thanks. In the second part of his question, um, can you provide uh, an update on how significant your orders are to your suppliers? So how big are your suppliers relative to the scale of the orders you're placing to them with them? And is there any risk of your supplier terms changing? Well, there's no risk of the suppliers terms changing. Uh, well, not at the moment. I mean, our terms with our suppliers are we pay on site. You know, we don't ask for any credit, so it's not like we're taking mm. 90 days credit. That's that's one of the reasons we get the best price and we get mm -hmm. good service. You know, we, we pay our suppliers and they love dealing with us and they'd like to do more work for us. But, you know, a lot of the factories we work with supply to other large manufacturers. They even have some of the their own people living on site auditing you know the the factories so we, we get the benefit of that uh, mm -hmm. oversight from other sort of prestige brands um uh, and they've all got plenty of capacity and we've also mentioned we, we use 25 plus factories mm -hmm. so you know and, and a factory if we need a million mascaras if factories say i can only do half a million we can get another factory to make the same mascara and make the other half a million so no there's there's no issue with capacity or flexing the model that we have. Good. Uh, then finally from Thanos, uh, are there any marketing differences between uh, the regions and does the, the TikTok ban in the, the potential TikTok ban in the US, um, would that have any impact do you expect? Well, it won't have any impact on us because we've not even launched our TikTok in the US <laughs> at the moment. We, we've actually we've got our TikTok uh is growing here we got um somebody to come in from another makeup brand that's done a really good job for us and they're growing our followers the, the first post she did we got 1.4 million views um i don't think there's going to be a, there may very well be a tiktok ban but there won't be because they'll obviously in my opinion someone will buy the business then no that's that's what's going to have to happen but uh at the moment it wouldn't affect us in the us thanks And then uh, can you tell me a little, tell us a little about your competitors, who, who your main competitors are? I suppose our competitors are the likes of Elf, Makeup Revolution, Barry M, you know, that sort of 15 to, to 30 demographic, affordable. I mean, we are more affordable than Revolution and, and Elf. Probably the big difference is they maybe they spend more on marketing, it's not something we do. We prefer to grow 15, 20% a year 
uh, and you know have a profitability go along with that. Uh, um, we don't want a business that grows you know, to, to revenue for the sake of revenue and does 200 million pounds next year and loses money. That's not our business model. So now compared to, I think in any business where there's a, a chance of a, a profit, you know, you're going to have competitors. I can't think of a business in the world that doesn't. You've just got to make sure you're, you're on your game. We make good product. Uh, we keep uh, churning out good stuff on social media. Uh, make the right product at the right price, get into the right retailers, and that will help us grow the business. Of course, there's going to be uh, other, other competition, but we're quite comfortable. We're, we're growing ahead of our sector. I, I think you know our sector is meant to be growing sort of five, six pence, six percent a year. We're growing well above that at the moment, mm -hmm. so uh, you know we're we're comfortable with what we're doing. Great. Okay, uh, then from Ralph. Uh, let me just read his question myself first. Okay, uh, so Ralph says that his impression is that um, Warpaint doesn't have a, a dead or w, W7 brand, doesn't have a dedicated display case in most of the stores he's seen it in. Um, how difficult is it to convince retailers to, to provide you with a dedicated uh, space? versus selling them um, alongside other products in a generic display case? Well, I, I don't know what retailers he's been in. The hardest the hardest thing is them is finding the space. It is hard, but, you know, so we went in, a good example, we went into 71 Super Drugs. That was the only space they could give us, and it was at the back of the store in their trend section. We did not expect any further rollout until 2025 because that is their next reset. And we always say once you get these cabinets in, and we're at the beginning of our journey, they're like a curbstone to get out. They're in there for two, three years. Mm -hmm. So we didn't expect anything this year. And lo and behold, we've sort of got another 60 to 65 um, sort of units into Superdrug in addition to the 71. Not only that, we're currently in 71 Superdrugs at the back of the shop, a two-foot stand with four shelves. They've now given us a two-foot stand with six shelves. So we've got a third more space there. Uh, and we've just, uh, and obviously in addition to the extra stores. Likewise, with Boots, we've had a rollout in Boots. We were in 84 stores. It wasn't they didn't want to roll us out earlier. It takes time. We've just been given another 100 stores. We did have a two-foot stand. We've now got a three-foot uh, footprint in most of the stores. So, yes, it, it is difficult. They have to take someone out to put you in, but we are find, finding that all the retailers we've been in with that kind of... Uh, sort of uh, system of stands have given us more space as as we've gone along. But it, yes, it, it, it is a slow burn, but we're still managing to grow, you know, 20 to 25 percent every year. Which is great. Yeah. So similar to the US, it's a question of, of time. Yeah. Clearly, once the retailers can see the volume of sales they, they can uh, get of your products, then they might be more inclined to, to well, give you Well, CVS is, is a good example of that. We had 190 stores. We just got an, an additional 379 with a bigger mm. footprint. We were in five below. We had sort of 400 stores. They gave us at the, the beginning of this year sort of, I think, 16, 1,700 stores. They're, they're now opening another 200 stores by the end of the year. We'll be in those. But we started off with them with... A, f a few hundred stores so mm. but you, you you do roll out if you prove uh that the, the, the pro product and the brand works yeah absolutely great okay then uh paul is asking about any recent hires you've made and the background of those managed We've hires uh, we, we've taken someone new on at the back end of last year in the u.s um, he was sort of working as a consultant. He's now working for us and he's helping manage the business. Mm -hmm. He's streamlined it. He's not able to just get into Walmart and sort of grow the business into CVS. He's also, we moved our third party logistics to a, a bigger facility to help us get ready for growth. It's also saved us money. He's also renegotiated some of the terms in terms of delivery costs 
uh, with some of our customers. So that's been sort of the main hire. We have had to take sort of people on to help with packaging and various things that have mm -hmm. come in. But this was all last year. There's been sort of no one new in for this year of any sort of consequence. You know, we've got, a, you know, a few new warehouse guys, maybe a bit more admin, but but no one of any consequence, no one sort of sort of top management other than we brought in two new uh, board members at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like the, your, your uh, hire in the US is, is doing a good job. Can you just say a little about his background before he joined you? Well, he, he went, he's an English guy. He went to America about 20 years. I'm not going to mention the company to grow, to, 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 to start a, a business. And he grew his division very, very quickly mm -hmm. from nothing to 40 million. Um, same sort of retailers, different product, but the Walmarts, maybe not the CVSs, but the Targets, those type of retailers, Kroger's. Um, so we think he'll be a, he's an accountant by um, by profession, and he's, he's, he seems to be doing a very good job for us. Great. Uh, then another one from Ralph. A rather specific one. Just before Christmas 2023, there seemed to be a wider range of W7 products available on the websites of CVS and HEB versus the product range available in early 2024. For example, HEB only seemed to show W7 nail polish in early 24. Can you comment on this apparent seasonality? I have no idea. I, I have no <laughs> idea what the reason, because we've in, increased our SKUs into to CVS. I don't know why there would be less SKUs. Maybe it's there. I, I, I have no idea. I mean, we, we're in the process of, of uh, giving them sort of more images for the new SKUs that have gone in. I don't know why HEB would only have nail enamel. That's, I, can, I can find out. No idea. Okay. Can't answer everything. Uh, right. Uh, so finally, Simon asks, um, what experiences have you made with running your own online store in the UK that could deter you or in fact deterring you from opening, opening one or several for Europe? So in, any learnings from, from running? No, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I, and I don't know the stats for Europe, but in the US, any cosmetic searches, 60% of them take place on Amazon. It's the first place people go to search. And I should imagine it's very, very similar in Europe. We could not deliver around Europe at the cost that Amazon do it for. We can do it in the UK. We've got our own infrastructure. We've got a web room here where, you know, we've got people that pick and pack and ship it out. But if we were to do that in Europe, we'd have to have a warehouse there. We'd have to have staff there. You've, you've got 26 countries in Europe. You know, how are we going to distribute all of that? And the same goes for the US. You know, if you look at the US, Amazon have got 140 depots or 143 depots around the US. What, what could we have? One in New York and one, at, you know, every, you'd want a FedEx a, a lipstick for it to get the, the next day on Prime. It would cost you more to send it than 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 you'd get for it. We're quite we're quite happy using Amazon uh, for the simple reason we just don't have it. it wouldn't be as cost effective for us yeah. to do it. it. It makes no sense. Yeah, their, their logistics <clears throat> scale is a, a clear, yeah. clear advantage. That's what they are. They're a logistics company. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thanks very much for all your time, uh, Sam, and for, for answering all the, all the questions. That's been great and fascinating to learn more about uh, war paint. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. listening.